Okay, so I'm just gonna start this straight out with some fear mongering. What do you say? My name is Eamon Victorson. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at Reagan University in Iceland. So, um, so I just want to preface this that these reporters came and like wanted to uh, have a discussion about like what, how do you teach security and all this stuff. And we had like a full day of interviews with various students and so forth. And then they came back with this, and this was a new story. I'm just preparing an email, uh, something that looks believable, but it's still something that contains something that people would find. Fascinating and quick maybe in it. The email I received seemed innocent enough. It was friendly and addressed me personally. Click the link. Opens up a page that is his, you know, personal website. And there's a PDF link at the bottom that's his resume. But actually when you open it, it does more than just open up. It's actually gonna uh, run a program on the computer that the user doesn't know about. So it looks like this is his resume here. Okay, now, now we're in here. Okay, excellent. We've got a connection here from this, uh, this person's computer. Elizabeth is not logged on. But what I have here is actual remote access to her computer, so I can can see all her files. Uh, I can do all kinds of stuff. Let's be a little mean and uh, scare her a little bit. So let's try this. Looks like my computer is talking to me. Let's take a picture of her. Just a little snap, a little flash. You usually don't notice it when it's just one picture being taken by your webcam. Oh, God. It's scary because it feels like someone's looking at my screen somewhere else, or looking at me, which is probably the scariest part. They know what I'm doing. Actually, I'm also going to get a copy of it here, so let's see if that works out. This is there, yes. So, let can see who the target is. Getting some older photos now. Here's some photo of her with someone, <laughs> and then we can just keep browsing through. Like, That's my boyfriend. Hi, on New Year's. So this is getting really creepy. These are like personal photos. Oh. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not too happy with this. In terms of that, the weakest link is always the human, and so we're kind of shooting a fish in a barrel. Doesn't mean that it necessarily works, but this is how how large organizations uh, actually go about attacking random people. Music that I definitely don't have on my computer. It's literally just funny music. It's not from my computer. Yeah, that was the only thing that remained from that interview. <laughs> anyway, so any questions about this? This is an example of spear phishing. We started talking about this a little bit last time. So you might take a particular person or maybe a group of people and a target. Adam State yeah. College. Great stories from okay. being here. We'll uh, stop that. I don't even know what that is. Adam State College. No thanks. Great. We're on a different one. So I showed you this picture of like how you hack a specific targets on the password. And then enter stuff on the email. Back Here's an actual uh, attack that we did against the company, um, at my company. Uh, this is Sindis. So we took some target over here and we breached uh, a workstation. Turns out that this outer perimeter of a network is usually the easiest thing to breach. So if you are in an organization and you're wondering if people can get through that external firewall into the computer, the answer is yes. And you should always assume that somebody can do that. This is the easiest thing to penetrate. You send you can first just do the spear phishing stuff where you send something to a people, to a person who's running like a, you know, it's an Apple computer or something, send something and exploit um, Acrobat or one of their things. But now you have access to some uh, external workstation. Now the key is to try to do what we call lateral movement to get to whatever it is that you're after, the data over here. So you breach these various services. So Jira is an example of like a, it's like a uh, an internal management service. There's a uh, wiki, wiki over here, you could go in here and you get some, some information about the authentication, monitor, and so forth. And you're like, the fact that you go in here and you just kind of like penetrate various parts of the system, you're now inside the organization, usually nobody's monitoring anything inside here, and you just proceed. And this is really a sad state of affairs. I'm telling you a little bit what's happening in the real world. It's that people invest so much money 
in their outer perimeter, depends. And then if somebody breaches, then they're like, we don't know what was hacked. We don't know what the code, we don't know if they're still there. Right? Can you guys help us? Or something like that. So um, the mantra of the day here, this is what's going here. Uh, the mantra of the day is really that you need to make sure that you have um, logs of all internal things that happen, all events that happen with different systems, that you're able to somehow reconstruct an attack when it has happened and be able to know where it goes. So anyway, so this is that, and so here's just like a, a, a demographic of what's happening in terms of what people buy. So if you look at the amount of money spent on, say, antivirus and things like that, 97.5% of the money is spent on the auto perimeter, like an antivirus or a firewall, something like that. And that's the easiest thing to overcome. It takes about half an hour to overcome any type of intrusion detection software, intrusion prevention. It's really just like, oh, they're running my NPS, okay. I have to modify my traffic like this. Usually it's not even triggered. Like, we have, um, we developed like this remote access Trojan, which you put on somebody's computer so that you can penetrate and so forth. And um, we sent it to Virus Total to try to see if any of the antivirus products would find it. And we didn't know that Virus Total actually in contrast with all the antivirus companies would be like, oh, here's new malware. So there was like a pack sent out against our remote access Trojan. We're like, oh. So what do we do? We recompiled it, and it was no longer detected by any antivirus. That's it. That's how bad antivirus really is. An antivirus, had, it actually is facing an impossible challenge, which is to identify whether or not something is a virus. You can't actually do that. Come to this level. You'd be solving the halting problem if you could do that. Um, so among other things, it needs to be, it needs to do is uh, take something that you're working on, some file that it opens up, and be like, hey, is this a virus or not? Oh, it's in a zip file. Okay, I'm going to decompress it. It has a limited time to do all these things. And it's like, oh, there's another zip file inside the zip file. Oh, no. And then just unzips. And it's like, oh, I'm out of time. Must be good. So you can imagine how people overcome antivirus most of the time, right? That's right. Um, and the same thing here is about being able to do any type of attribution inside what happened. Um, it's a, these are small but really emerging markets right now. And this is a, the right time to enter this, this stage right now, is, is, uh, because we have, what, six million jobs opening up in the next three years? And computer security is insane. Like, it's really on, um, on the roll. So we didn't get to this last time, but I wanted to give you a little bit of a tentative schedule of what we're going to be covering in this course, right? So we're going to be diving into binary exploitation. We're going to do a lot of hands-on labs, including we're going to have actually something that opens up today, which is bomb lab. I'm going to be giving an actual binary bomb. It's a binary, you don't get the source code, and if you run it, it blows up and lets me know. You lose points. It sucks, you know? So what are you gonna need to do? Well, you're gonna need to reverse engineer it, or crack it, or whatever you wanna call it, and change it so that you can figure out the magic phrases that need to be entered so that you can overcome the bomb, diffuse it. So that's the first problem, uh, that's a 7% um, then we'll start with buffer overflows, and we'll do some uh, shell code, some more interesting stack overflows. We'll talk about some of the defenses that have been mounted against binary exploitation, which are include non-executable stack, um, talk about address space randomization, we'll talk about elaborate things like keep overflows and so forth. We'll do a really fun lab here called Taunt Lab. This is just a series of kind of modern looking um, programs that you can write exploits against. Um, we'll talk about how everything breaks, so we'll have a lab about web security and a whole bunch of other stuff here. We'll talk about some of the ethical dilemmas that get created by the power that is hacking. Um, we'll talk about how you can exploit randomness, or actually the limits of randomness. So you actually, I'll give you a blackjack server, and your goal is to make $10 million. Um, we'll talk a little bit about encryption, a little bit about social engineering. Hopefully we'll get to at least include a lecture about agro security or Chrome Sandbox or something. We'll have a whole lecture about network security, so sniffing and spoofing and all that stuff. Um, we'll have one lecture about wireless security, <coughs> how can you hack into those access points, or actually how can you hack into an entire organization by taking their access point. And we may have an optional lab here called Sandbox Escape. Okay? Something that we will do in, during this course is that you guys are going to be preparing a YouTube video for the world about some topic that you're becoming an expert in. This is your recorded student presentation worth 15 and I may be pairing you guys up. I'll have to think about that a little bit. 
There's a midterm and a final, and they account for 15% to 25% of your trades. And I updated the Google spreadsheets for uh, dates. I think I've not even told you about this, have I? That there was a Google spreadsheet. Anyway, we have more announcements here. So we have this Tia over here. This is uh, Tia, it's very well known. He's been in films like Curveball. Oh, that's me. Yeah. Oh, I figured that out. Yes. How did oh, I, I Googled you, and this is all that came up. It said you were an, an extra in a film. I was. <laughs> Yeah, it wasn't an extra though. I found you an IMDb for all. I didn't find you an Emory. <laughs> okay, this is Aaron's retreatment. So he took this. He took this course last fall, and then he wants to take it again now. Now that it has a different name, but instead of making him the TA, so he'll be helping out with that. Very sure. He's tinkering. He'll be tinkering until the end of the slide. Um, we're kind of thinking that you either have some sort of office hours or maybe even be in the lab one day a week or something like that so people can come with questions about C, Linux, life, whatever they have. Um, so it'll be a resource. We have a website. So internet.com slash CS453 is the kind of main base for operations. We have Piazza, which is this thing over here. I sent you guys invitations. If you have not received any emails from me yet, let me know, because you're supposed to have. Uh, you may not be signed up for the course properly, or something like that. Uh, I'll have to create access to, to our Triton server, which is over here, and I'll add you to Piazza. Anybody here who's not received an email? How about with credentials and stuff? No? Okay, great. And first homework is out, the bomb lab here. <coughs> okay, more powerful animations. And we even have a scoreboard set up, and I see that there are some people already tinkering away with their bombs. So I'll look at this. Where is my browser? Bomb Lab Score Lab. Let's see. That's how it's going. The Bomb Lab Scoreboard. Still waiting. Come on. At least what we've seen now is that there's somebody here who has incurred 53 explosions. And 12. You're, not, you're supposed to not have explosions. <laughs> it's supposedly implicit. It actually decreases your score. And imagine this is real world, right? This is the herd locker, right? Yeah. So 53 explosions is actually, I think, a record. <laughs> so there's a trick. There's a way in which you can prevent any uh, explosion to take place if you're just careful with your breakpoints. Yes. So how many people have actually used GDP before? Right, we should maybe then talk a little bit about it. In any case, um, what we'll be doing today is to start off with some uh, fast-paced assembly, if you guys are ready for that. Before that happens, any questions? <coughs> this is not made by me, this is one of my students who made this, so it's incorporated into, uh, into the slides, right? So, most of you have taken 255, is it that we talked about assembly? And what kind of assembly did you guys learn there? Motorola? Yeah. Yeah. We're going to be talking about an actual assembler that makes sense for the world today. Which is x86. Make sense? So um, it should be fundamentally not so different in that the operations that you have are, are similar. But it's still kind of it's what's actually running on your laptops and your phones and your watches. Not your watch, but maybe it's on your watch. Um, so what is assembly really? Why are we studying assembly? It's really this idea that we can understand what's under the hood of your computer, right? And it kind of begets the question, why would you even study this? So why would you study assembly? You want to get closer to the computer? Cue music. <laughs> yeah, if you want to understand what your computer is doing, right? It's paid well. Hmm? It's paid well. There's really one fundamental reason why I study something. It's cool. <laughs> it's awesome. Right? How else could you get, like, to spend hours and hours debugging stuff that makes no sense? It's actually like probably good reasons are reverse engineering. You could actually get a, a very lucrative six figure job taking all those viruses that are coming out, reversing them, and making patches, right? Kind of like what I was telling you about with virus total. 
right, where there's a new virus that comes out of a new malware, and you have to reverse it and figure out what it's doing and tinker with it and, and see how you could um, create a patch against it. Right? That's a very well paid job, and not too many people can do it, right? Great money. Um, now, let me show you a little bit of motivation here. And this kind of ties together some of the reasons for why we're even studying computer science. So you guys remember way back in the day, you learned about Turing machines, right? Everybody learned about Turing machines? So here is a video wondering like, what fundamental questions that you may have had. So have a calendar. And what can you get? You can help the Turing machine that can help you. What do you actually make? The Turing machine with a money drop. Because so that's an actual Turing machine, right? So it's a spectacular construction. Okay, that's that's fine. Okay, so let's see it. This is a uh, the tape over here. It's not quite infinite, but it could be in some other universe. You can see that this bit is sad or it's not sad and so forth. If you think about the operations that a Turing machine is really doing, an assembler is not that different, really. It's about reading and writing to memory locations, right? So he's writing. Isn't that cool? This is really what we'll get to the dates. Making something like this, right? People are going to be like, wow, you made a... Uh, Lego is building like a new mobile headquarters. They are? Yeah. Well, they I don't know about that part, but they're really <laughs> That sounds good, actually. Well, they have computers, because uh, <laughs> they could use this as a kind of a base for them. Yeah. So an assembler is actually not that different. Like, here's the assembly code. What does this assembly code do? And you look at it, and you're like, well, what, why am I in this course? Um, and um, then you look at it a little bit harder, you start to see, like, well, maybe how is it going to recognize what? You can see that there's memory here on the, it's like the left column. And you can see kind of flips of instructions over here. And you see that there's only like a handful of these percent things here, like the registers. But really what we're working with is kind of like the Turing machine. It's like we're reading and we're writing memory. And we have like a few pockets that effectively are registers that we can do stuff with. So we're like add stuff up and we're like putting one of our pockets. And we run our pockets really fast and we can take it. We have to shove it somewhere into memory. And that's kind of what we do. That's, that's all that an assembly really does. Right? And so, because this is extremely tedious to write in, I just wrote a web server in this and I've written two and two. I shouldn't say it. <laughs> um, but um, it's easier to write in a slightly higher level language. So, what we end up with is that we have code like C, which is effectively like a shell on top of assembler that makes you sing. And then C is kind of dangerous, so you have another language that translates things into C and so forth. So, you end up with this hierarchy of higher level languages that are kind of a little bit far removed from this underlying code. We're going to shortcut all that stuff. We're going to straight to the code, and then we're going to build layers on top of it. So what is happening here? Can anybody guess what this code does? Checks this Yeah. Yes. Very well read. Um, yeah, because the symbols are still in there, which is not true for all code. It's a checksum. What is a checksum? Well, it's kind of making sure that if we deliver a packet over the internet and it could get corrupted by the random things that can happen on the internet. Well, the checksum kind of makes, <coughs> makes sure that things are kind of have the same integrity as they did before. Okay? So this is a checksum routine. So it's really a, a loop here with the stacking some parts of memory and uh, adding stuff up and XORing things and doing stuff. And then adding, in the end, it's going to end up with some sum over here and EAX and it's going to return that and this is the push you Anyway, we'll get to that. So let's take a little view of uh, what it is like to be a CPU. If you're a CPU, this is a really you know, daunting, boring proposition. Probably, hopefully none of you will have to be CPUs in the future. Um, if you're a CPU, your goal in life is really just to kind of execute stuff. And all you have there is to kind of have your program counters telling you where in memory you are currently executing stuff. It's kind of like where that Lego Turing machine is just currently located. That's the program counter. Also known as EAP, or instruction point. And you have a few pockets, which are your registers. You have condition codes that we'll talk about. And your whole interaction with the world, this is your life, is to talk to memory <coughs> and some other devices. 
That's it. They need to read memory, they can write stuff. And remember that everything in a computer, including code and data, they're kind of together in memory. There's no difference between code and a movie, right? They look kind of just like a series of bytes in memory. Right? It's just that if the program counter ever enters a part of memory, it's going to be interpreted as being code. That's what, does this make sense? That's a crucial observation for our, what we're going to do as hackers. We're going to actually confuse data and code at some point. Right? We're going to be shoving stuff into a program that is supposedly data, and we're going to corrupt the program so that it thinks it's code and execute it. Aha. Ah, yes, that's right. Yeah, very cool, yeah. So these are the names of um, uh, the program counter, also known as instruction pointer. And we're going to be doing kind of 32-bit stuff here. And it's not what Amy Daniel with 64-bit architecture just did. Um, but it translates really, really well. We have a register file, which is all the stuff that we use for indexability. And we have only a handful of these. And they're called things like EAX and EAX. And then we have condition codes that really just say, recently when you were adding stuff up, was it really big? Was it zero? That's the kind of level of information we have in condition codes. It's a bunch of bits that just tells us something of the last arithmetic operation of this. And in memory, we're assuming that it's just this giant long strand of bytes. Could be infinite, but it's usually about like four gigs or something. If it's 32 bits, you're kind of bound by having four gigs. Because it's all your code, all your usage, and all your stuff. And then we also have inside it a stack, which we'll talk about, which is helping us actually make procedural programs. Now, how does this assembly code come to be? Well, normally what we do is that we write a C program, unless you're insane. So you write a C program, and it does some stuff. And then your C compiler takes the program, and it calls um, the assembler. And we can actually get this intermediate code while we're at it. So we can actually say, hey, here's our, our, here's our intermediate assembly expression. Let's just write a little code here and just show you this at work here. So let me open up Putty here, and let's just go to, sure, mainframe. Hack the mainframe, right? OK. Eventually. Maybe it's already been hacked. While we wait, I will parallelize this and go to try to, aha. Uh -huh. Actually, this may be faster. Uh -huh. Or not. There we go. Okay. Um, class. It's not a button. Hello. Now let's write the least interesting C program that we could think of. What is the least interesting C program you think of? Is thinking of the same one as me? Hello again. Okay. Oh. It's right. Okay. So I'm just going to create an executable from this, right? How many people are f comfortable with Linux or Unix over here? Okay. Most of you. Good. Okay, if you have questions, error is right there. <laughs> Great, okay. Um, so what I've done is that I've taken this 77 byte C file and I've made a binary. The binary is like 6,000 bytes. It's insane. If I run the binary, it says hello again. Now, what I wanted to do is to show you that actually you don't have to get the binary straight out. We're going to be calling this magic minus s operator. And we're going to see what happens intermediate. Ooh. Magic. What's happening? We've actually seen the intermediate assembly representation of Hello World. Most of this is just complete bollocks. Like, who cares about C if I start parking? I don't even know what that's supposed to do. The most important things here are things like call puts, which just says, Called put string. So most of this, the workhorse behind what's happening in this program is in a routine called puts. It's just print a string. So all it's doing right here is saying, like, hey, I want to take that string over there, and I want puts to print it out, and then I just want to exit. And I want to exit with return zero. And that's the next instruction. That's it. Such beautiful sounds here in the background. Okay. So that's uh, an example of the intermediate assembler for a C program. Now what happens next is that we create this binary object. The binary object is a series or sequence of instructions that are going to be written. Great. That's actually not the end of the story there. Because where does puts come from? 
how does it come to be? Who owns it? Why is it? So there's this thing called the linker, which is like, oh, you call something like printf, or you call it books, or you call it one of these uh, built-in library calls. Well, let me link those things up to the libraries that are on your computer. So that takes the binary object over here, and creates an executable that knows how to find something like printf. And there you go. That's how you move from C program to Mac. All aboard? So I'm going to be doing, I know this is either painstakingly slow for some of you who know all this stuff, or really, really, really fast for people who don't know this stuff. I'm recording all these lectures. I will provide all the slides and all this stuff so you can, uh, you can think about it. The exercises that I'm giving you guys will actually prompt a lot of questions that have been coming up in class. So you're going to be like, oh, okay, I'm in TDP and I'm, I see this instruction. What was this instruction again? Well, let's look at kind of the reference material that's covered in class. So we'll be kind of going through this in two or three lessons, and then we'll end up in a place where we kind of feel like slightly comfortable with what a sampler is and so forth. We start to create our own shell classes. So here's an example of a slightly trickier C program. What does it do? Actually, what does it do? Well read. Yes. It's the sum routine. It takes two things in, x and y, and it returns the sum of them. Now let's actually look at what happens here in the sun. So somehow there are six things that it needs to do. But in fact, we only care about a few of them. We don't really care about this first two push and, and uh, move operations. So we don't care about the latter two, the pop and the ret. That's just for setting up a so-called stack. Really all that's happening in here is this move operation and this add operation. So we'll get back to that. This is how we obtained it. We called GCC. We told GCC that we wanted it to be a 32-bit binary. We told not to optimize it too much, and we want the assembly perfect. That's what these flags over here. Right? So that's how this was retrieved. Now, if we're talking about these operations, this move L and add L and all this stuff, we're going to need to start to introduce something that's fundamental to assembly which is that it has a few data types. Data types can be something like an integer. An integer could be one byte, could be two bytes, could be four bytes, could even be eight bytes. And everything pretty much is an integer when you are, as far as assembly is concerned. Even memory addresses are kind of four byte addresses. Now why do four byte addresses suffice for addresses? Or four byte integers of five addresses. Well, for today's system, they don't. They don't. Correct. No, they kind of limit you at how big? Um, Thirty-two bit addresses. Yeah. So four billion, four gigabytes. Right. So four bytes mean that you have thirty-two bits, which means that you have four gigabytes to play with. And if your world is 32 bits, that's fine. That's all you need to be able to reference. So your addresses are four bytes in the 32 bit world that we created here. In the 64 bit world, which is what most of your computers are running right now, they're eight bytes. There's no fundamental difference between what's happening since the addresses are longer. And we're hoping we don't run out of those just yet. Two to the 64 is a fairly big number. Don't quote me on that. Oh, damn, I recorded it. <laughs> okay. The only thing that we have are floating point data. Notice how. Absent from this list is the notion of a string or an object or anything like that. We don't have anything like that in assembly. It's all these numbers. Right? All of these numbers could mean whatever. So we have floating point data. We don't even have arrays or structures or classes. That's just compounded by the way we access the sequence of data. So if you want to have an array, you really just allocate a contiguous chunk of bytes. We'll get to this. Now, what can you do with this data that you have, these integers? Well, you could do something really, really fun, like you could add them up or uh, multiply them with something. And the way you do that is that you, you take something from your register and you multiply it with another register, or maybe something from memory. The way it's set up is that you can transfer stuff from uh, uh, one of your registers to memory or back and forth, or you can do arithmetic on them. And the other thing that you can do in assembler is that you can transfer control. 
This means that if you're a program counter somewhere and you've been executing for a while, you could jump to a random other place. Not random, like a particular other place. Right? Or for instance, you've been running in a loop, and now you need to continue the loop, so you go back a few steps and you keep doing it again and again. You just move more back and forth. Right? That's a loop in the center. So there's some transfer of control, moving that program counter. This is all you need to implement all modern software. This is what runs in your CPU. It's amazing that you can, it's so powerful as an abstraction. So here's a slightly, even further down under the hood, representation of the program as you did earlier. Instead of showing it just the assembly representation, this is the binary code behind the sum. And if you're really, really lonely, you could see like, oh, the first one, OX55, is a push EBP. OX89 E5 is move ESP EBP. And you start to recognize these things. Like, oh, C3 is return. There's only a handful of these. This is how the uh, CPU organizes different instructions. And you'll see these instructions here are one, two, or three bytes. And they could be up to like 10 bytes long. This whole thing, adding up two numbers, is 11 bytes. The binary executable word is what? 20 megabytes? I have no idea why there's so much bloat in modern software, but really, you can do a lot of stuff in very few number of bytes here. Okay, so then we have the linker, and the linker is responsible for when you're making the program, when you're compiling the program, figuring out that, like, oh, you're calling this thing called malloc, or new, or printf or even something more high level. I need to know where that is so that I can call it and put it in the right spot. Okay? So let's go back to this example a little bit and just delve into it. We're gonna be on this kind of assembly express chain today. I hope it's okay. So, here's the C code. We're gonna add two numbers. What do we need to achieve? Well, we need to get, um, we need to get the result into some place so that we can return it from the procedure that call. And the way that works in assembly is that you move it into a register called EAX. It's just one of the few registers that we have to play with. So this is the assembly over here. Add L8 of EPP with EAX, and that's it. Really what's happening over here is that the assembly is trying to do the following. It's trying to say like, hey, I have this integer called EAX. I have this pointer here called EPP pointer here being just a memory address. And I'm going to take whatever is at EBP, but eight bytes away from it, or two four-byte integers away. And I'm going to take that thing over there, and I'm going to add it to EAX. No matter what was in EAX before, I'm just going to add it. That's all expressed in this compact notation over here. So if we break it down, it says add whatever is eight bytes away from the EBP pointer to whatever's in EAX and store it at EAX, and the L here actually implies working long, <laughs> meaning working 32 byte, or 32 bit increments. So if I had substituted L here with say B, I would have been taking a byte, one byte from this memory address here, A to EPP, and added it to EAX. Does that make sense? We'll be kind of coming back and forth to this question. Did I hear a question only in my mind? Please ask questions. Um, this is the assembly, or actually binary code code. Yeah. Um, so, so like the, the add and the push and the pop, all those calls, this, this comes to us from the linker? No. So the, this is actually the assembly language itself. This is a few primitives that are things like move, add, push, pop, subtract, so forth. When we're in the C code representation of things, so we're calling methods or functions or procedures or whatever we're going to call them that are things like malloc or something like that. Those exist in external libraries. So for instance, when I was making my C program earlier, I, um, I included something called app. Wrong key map. Okay. Um, I included standard IO.h. Okay. Why did I do that? Because I know that standard IO contains printf. So here I'm in the C world. So to make everything resolve in the C world, we need the linker. In the assembly world, we just have a few commands that we can work with. More questions? This just makes sense, right? Everybody here? How many people are still with me? Okay, okay. Good. So we're going to speed up a little. 
Okay, so here's the actual sum procedure again. So this is what's going to happen here is that you have these uh, objects over here. This is the assembly code over here. And here's the kind of uh, higher level representation of, the, of that assembly code. So these two things are equivalent. We have binary code over here. Here's the interpreted assembly code. Same exact thing. If we wanted to see this at work, this is what we would do. We would open up a debugger, known as the uh, GNU debugger. So this is actually code this up here for fun. Let's change our hello program. Let's add a little sum to it. We'll just say here like int sum, int x, int y, and then there was int was t, x plus y, and we'd return t, uh, make, okay. S, oh, hello, dot s, hello, dot c, and let's optimize it once. And actually, let's make it 32 bits. And then I will do GDB hello. Oh, wait. No, I uh, wanted to do it differently. I don't want the assembly code. I want the binary. GDB hello. This as main, this as sum. Here, I'm disassembling an actual section from the binary. Notice how it's scarily similar to what we have on the slide, right? That's pure luck. <laughs> it's different addresses, and that's just because I had some other stuff in the program. And what they uh, recommend here is that you can actually look at this this part of the program called sum here, and I can just get it in. I can examine it, which is the X method over here, and I can get 11 bytes from sum. Oh, uh, I want it in hex. And here's the I'll just show you what's in a binary. Okay. You can do this through Windows, you can do it through WinWork, or whatever you want. You can do this in anything. Um, I can take, uh, you know, ls that everybody types, right? And you type ls, la la la. GDB bin ls. Disassemble main. Uh, disassemble start. Uh, disassemble, what can I disassemble here? I can disassemble. Uh, anything that's in here that's being called, let's do free. So far, I can just start investigating how a program works, right? I start run. And I can start here, where am I? I'm running in start. I can disassemble where I am. And I can step through it. One, sorry, one instruction at a time. I can step through and I can view all my registers. This is my entire register file. So the stuff that I've shown in our slides already is extremely powerful. And we'll be doing that for our bomb. When you're taking away the bomb, this will be your environment. Cool? Yeah, okay. When I look at a, a crowd and everybody looks like this, I have absolutely no idea what's going through your mind. Okay? Great. So reactions are good. Reactions are good. Okay. So this is under the hood here. Let's talk a little bit about all this stuff. So I'm just going to do like a breath first search of, uh, of assembly. So I'm going to be kind of coming back to some of the topics again. Okay. So let's look at the registers. We have a few of them. And they're called EAX, ECX, ETX, EPX. And now the OCD people are going like, why isn't this alphabetic? <laughs> and, then, uh, <laughs> and then there's ESI, EI, and ESP. And there's like this really archaic reason for why it's not alphabetic. Which I'm not going to tell you because you know it's indeed. Uh, no, it's actually uh, uh, the, it used to be that you used the AX register for accumulation. If you wanted to like add stuff up, and you used the C register as a counter. And there's like some like archaic reasons for this, because you know Intel back in the day they made this 8-bit CPU, right? And then everything there was effectively called AL and CL. There's, there was sort of practically a 16-bit uh, CPU. And then they were like, oh, okay, we need to be able to accommodate something more than that. So they like enlarged it and extended it. So they, we have all the legacy stuff still in our CPUs. You can still run a 1988 Pac-Man on your computer in like native mode. It's backward compatible. It's insane. So there's like actual real estate on your CPU die being dedicated to stuff that nobody on the planet is running right now. Because if they were to remove it, five people would get furious. Right? They would call and complain. So people have seen that like Microsoft tried to do this and like kick out driver support for like printers that are like bigger than your house. They're like maybe not every single computer needs to have a driver for this type of a printer. 
And then just like people with bananas, there was a protest on the street. It was like, why did you cut support for this thing? So yeah, Microsoft Windows got the support for everything in the world. Because they asked it. Um, so anyway, so we're very compatible with this, the 8-bit, the 60-bit mode. This is the 32-bit mode. And what do you think happened when we went to 64-bit? Yes. Everything came along with it, all the old baggage. We have all these old registers still in our 64-bit architectures. Anyway, we don't, so actually when we're writing programs, we can still reference things like BH, which would be the third byte in EPH. So you may see this when you're moving stuff back and forth. For instance, if I'm moving one byte, I tend to be dealing actually with things like BL and PL and so forth, but they are part of the register called EDX and EDX. Then we have this thing called the source and the destination register. This is ESN and EDN. And they're still used as such. They're really used for array manipulation. And then there are the kind of don't touch category over here. The stack pointer and the base pointer. We do not mess with those. We just use those because they're part of our bookkeeping of where we are in the program. Of course, this is a hacking course. Guess where we're really spending our time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. Okay. Cool. Okay. So. Let's talk about some of the stuff you can actually do in assembly. You can move data. That's okay. Okay. <laughs> Crowd's going well. Okay. Um, so we're moving. We can move stuff from a source to destination. And keep uh, looking at the order of these two things. So I'm showing you the at and syntax. Sometimes when you look at assembly, you'll see the Intel syntax, which is of course the exact opposite. Just for clarity, right? So the good thing about standards is that there are so many of them, <laughs> right? So here we take whatever is in the source register and we move it to the destination, which could be a register, it could be something else. So for instance, you could take what's called an immediate value, which is just a constant, and I could just move it. I could say like I want to move uh, OX400, which is just hexadecimal 400, to a register. Let's open up like a notepad here to show here. I could do move L. Uh, Movel uh, OX400 to EX, right? Now, I could also move between registers. I could say, hey, I want to move whatever is in EDX and I want it in ESI. Makes sense, right? Source, destination. And I could also reference memory. And the way I, uh, the notation that we use for memory access is this is parentheses notation. So this means all the pointers. Is there somebody here who has nightmares about the pointers? Not yet. <laughs> oh, not yet. Okay. You're in for a ride. <laughs> you will understand pointers so well after this course. We're going to be tinkering with them all the time. Really, all that a pointer is, is that there's a register, let's say EAX, and it has the value OX, like 08, 04, 1, 2, 3, 4, something like that. It's just, it could be a, a value, but if we interpret a value as a pointer, meaning that it is referencing something that's in memory, and memory starts at OX0000, and in this case here it ends at OX F, 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 F something, then it just means that if we have this parentheses notation here around VX, it's going to be like, oh, the value that I want, it's not actually in this register, it's in location OX0804. One, two, three, four. And here, there are four bytes that I'm going to retrieve and I'm going to do something with it, right? So if I write something like move L, whatever is in the AX, to say EBX, what's going to happen is that the CPU is going to ask the memory to like retrieve these four bytes over here and it's going to move it into the EBX register on the register file. So the register file is actually. It's physically on the CPU right next to where it's doing its operations. It's like the fastest possible memory you could have. It takes sub nanosecond to move stuff onto your register file. To access your memory, it takes 100 nanoseconds. That's like the cache memory, right? Uh, actually, sorry, there's a cache memory that's 5 nanoseconds, and then there's like the DRAM, which is 100 nanoseconds. Do you know how long it takes to get something from disk, like your hard disk? No seconds. And how much f slower is that? Just yeah. orders of magnitude. Three orders, four orders. We're talking about hundreds of millions of nanoseconds, right? So in other words, your CPU is doing all these amazing things, and it's like, oh, I have to get this stuff from disk 
in a sense, the request that it is like <laughs> waiting. In fact, it is so eager to do other stuff that it actually speculates about what's going to come, and it's going to do other stuff. I'm going to just gonna, I'm going to assume it's going to be a zero, and I'm going to keep going with other stuff, and then eventually, like this courier goes to the disk and gets the stuff, and like many eons later, it gets the data. Here's the data master, and it's like, oh, it was a zero. I have to like scratch everything that I. Uh, that I computed because it wasn't what I expected. And do it all again. Your your machine's actually speculating because your 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 memory is so slow relative to everything else. This is why caches are important. Anyway, so that's a detour a little bit. So we have um, memory accesses. So let's look at exactly what you can do with with MOA. You could do MOA number into say EDX. How would you write this in C? What would be the kind of C code representation of doing it like this? Um, would you uh, declare a pointer and then set that to There's um, no pointer involved here. Yeah, it's just a register. Just cool. It's just like, yeah, some there, yeah. some variable gets the value for. Because it's, it's, we're actually dealing with the value for right here. That's what the dollar indicates here. But you could also move it into memory. And then um, we need to point it by C. What could this be in C? Yeah. Or it's more like star temp, right? Follow temp, or star P, or whatever you want to call it. Follow some pointer and give that memory location the value minus one forty seven. Does that make sense? So now instead of putting it into like directly into EAX, we're gonna like put the value here. What we do is if we follow what's in EAX, we shove it into here in memory. Make sense? What's really gonna cook your noodle is that we can actually have another memory address in here if you wanted to. One, two, three, eight. Ha 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 ha. We can go in here, and, and if we express in assembly that we want to actually follow a pointer, and then we want to follow another pointer, so we can. We can make a chain of these. In C, that would be two stars. So we could say star, star, P equals something. That means go in here, retrieve something. That's another memory address. Find that memory address, retrieve something, or write something. And then you're done. Make sense? <laughs> are, are those used a lot in pointers? No, 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 I mean like, like a pointer to a pointer? Yes, they are used a lot. Yeah, so in fact, pretty much everything that's object-oriented is almost automatically giving pointers to pointers. Yeah, because you want to have so-called smart pointers so that like, they can be accessed from multiple locations, and they themselves contain pointers to actual memory. So they're very common. Three-way kind of pointers, they're more rare. They're an endangered species. Right? Or like, they're just like a tedious species. You really don't need to. You can move between registers, which in C would be something like A equals B. Yeah, for instance, right? Or temp one equals temp two. Please don't write code like this. I looked at code that I wrote as a kid, and there's like, oh no, int blah blah one blah two blah three blah with an H. I'm like, and you're like, I have no idea what this code is doing. Because like the names are terrible. So yeah, so I have temp two and temp one. Just like name it what it's doing. It's not that hard. Okay, move um, some value here to Ooh. Remember location point two by you next. What could this be? Let's see. Where's the star? I hear all these fragmented thoughts. <laughs> Can somebody express just like a little statement that would be a C statement that would do something similar to this? Remember, source, destination. There's a collision. Yeah. You do it that way, right? Um, so, Remembering that this is the source, this is the, the actual value over here, and this is where it's going, so it's kind of like exactly case here. Right? And of course you could have the star another way, you could go the other way around. In which case it would be something like temp equals star. Right? 
take whatever is in P, follow it, get the, get the value, and put it into this immediate register over here somewhere. Now, there's something mysteriously absent from this chart. No memory to memory. Why is there no memory to memory? Why on earth couldn't it take something that's here in memory, move it somewhere else in memory? Power point. Why is this prohibited? Did, what's that? Yeah, so the thing is that you're taking something from memory and you're moving it to somewhere else. Whatever is taking it is kind of acting like a register, isn't it? Right? So, but why wouldn't it just be a special register just for that? Right? Well, they're expensive, so you might as well expose it. The real reason, so that's one of the reasons. Now, another reason is just that actually moving something to, from memory to the register file that's right there, because you can imagine there'll be a special register in memory or something like that. And then moving it out, really, this is dominated by the cost of actually having to access memory. So, and then you're doing it again, right? So you're having two slow couriers, right? So like the additional overhead of touching a register on the CPU is minuscule in comparison to the extra effort that would be required to be able to implement this as direct uh, transfer. Now this was the logic for a long time, and then people realized like, well, actually, we may need something called direct memory access (DMA) where maybe you can just have a device, like a USB stick, that's just directly copying stuff to memory without touching the CPU. And that's fine. So for our purposes, though, we can't do this. There are no, uh, there, you just get an error in your assembly when you try to move from one memory to another. So this also means that we're always shuffling our registers. Like, oh, I have this beautiful value in EDX, and I'm out of registers. Oh, I'm going to have to push over the stack. You have to get this stuff from memory, put it back, get stuff back from the stack. So you do a lot of kind of manipulation. So the 64-bit architectures, they actually added a bunch of registers because it's getting a little bit crowded. So what we have here, this is um, the memory address. So remember that I've just used this parenthesis notation earlier to say, like, hey, I just want to read something from, from memory, right? So in this case here, here's EAX, and I just wanted to say, like, Let's just do it in Notepad over here. Um, I want to say move um, EAX to say EDX or something like that. But maybe what I want is not here, but here, right? We wanted to talk about this. What do I write if I want to get the value that's not being pointed to by EAX, but something that's close to it? The answer there maybe no. You do an offset. You say like, hey, I don't want EIX per se. I want something that's like 8 bytes away from or 12 bytes away from EIX, 16 bytes. Right? Makes sense, right? So that's the notation you have for it. And that really just means I want to get the memory address at register plus D over there. And then we can go a little bit further than that. Okay, I won't do it just yet. But in a little bit, we'll go a little bit further than that. We have everything we need to go back to our example, though. So, here's an example where we take two pointers and we swap their content. Bonus question. Can you do this without any temporary registers? Any temporary variables? Yes. Okay. Um, so anyway, what we do here is so we create two temporary variables called T0 and T1. We move the content into them and then we take them out. And so what the assembler here is doing is a bunch of Memory operations. Now, what actually is happening? Let's dissect this a little bit. We're going to ignore this blue stuff here because that has to do with stack that we're not going to talk about just yet. Okay, so let's dissect this thing. We have four registers that are going to be doing most of our work. And this is the main code down here. And here's the meaning of the code. So when I ask you questions about, hey, what's happening over here? You can just read it off here from the slide. Okay? What's happening there? Um, does the swap routine itself make sense? I'm taking XP and YP and I want to swap what they point to. Right? So what we do, we start up here and we execute this 
Maduro. Ik bedoel, moet wel één individu idiot. Well, let's look at our EPG register machine. Like, well, let's put this value over here, 104. So we follow 104 in our memory. We see this over here. And then we do what? EPG points to 104. So how do we do this red method over here? We add 8 to this, right? Which moves us further up over here. So we take this value over here, OX124, and what do we do with it? Put it in the EDX. No EDX down, or ECX? Wait, what? No EDX over there. 1, 2, 4. And what do we do next? Go 12 above 0. Which is what value? Uh, OX120. Yes, and we move it into ECX. ECX, so we've got that over there. Great, okay. And then what do we do? Someone in this right hand column. Ha ha. Yes, I didn't think I'd see that. I wondered what to do. What is happening next? What does this do? Square. Um, you take one of the EDX, which is one, the OX024, and you view it as a as an address. Yeah, it's a pointer. So you look in memory to see what's at OX24. And what is there? Some value. It's the value. Of one, two, three, right? And we move it to EPX. So EPX now becomes 1, 2, 3. And now the next one, if you follow similarly, we want ECX points to, which is the value 6. We move it to EPX. So EPX now becomes 4, 5, 6. And now what do we do? Put it in the value to what? to what EDX points to, which is address 1 to 4, which is where currently we have <coughs> 1 to 3. So we overwrite the 1 to 3 with 4 plus 6. Now actually two copies of 4 plus 6 in memory, but it's okay because we have our temporary variable. And now the last one is going to write the value of EDX 1 to 3 to what ECX points to, which is OX. 120, which is up there, which is where 4 by 6. So the second one is located. Okay. What have we done? We have swapped the values 1 to 3 and 4 by 6 in memory. That is what your computer is doing all the time. What a boring job. <laughs> yeah. Makes sense, right? Great, okay. So, here's the generalization that I want to show you before. Now, instead of just having an offset, just to make things a little bit more complicated, Let's see. So instead of just saying x, t what if I wanted to say like, well, I don't want just the 16 bytes of b x. I actually have another value I want to add to it. I have the value of e c x I want to add to there. <laughs> what does this mean? This actually means go to the memory address at e a x plus e c x and then add 16 bytes to it. And that's the memory address that you that you want to get stuff from. Ooh. And then they were like, oh, yeah, this looks very complicated. What do we do? Let's make it more complicated. So they added one more thing to it. They said, like, well, actually, I don't want just ECX. I want, like, four times ECX. So now you have this notation over here. So people look at this first, and they're like, yeah, I'm just going to go back into math. Okay? So this thing here is the most general thing that you have. It says that you have displacement at the beginning, you have a base register called RB, you have a, another index register, RI, and then you have a scaling factor. And the scaling factor can be a number one, two, four, and eight, and no other numbers. What? Yes, so what is the reason? Like, why, why, this is the size of the integers, but why on earth would you be restricted like that? Because otherwise you'd get a, like a value that's offset, and you wouldn't be starting at the beginning of the byte. 
Yeah, but if you've got a weird character or something, maybe you could conceivably want a different scale, like a negative number, something like that. is easy. Metric is easy. So there's actually two reasons for it. One of them is that the purpose of this thing here is to make arrays be easy to do. Because in an array, you have the base of the array, which is where you start, and you want the thing that's 17 array elements ahead, right? And the arrays only comprise the things that are either bytes, or words, or longs, or 8 bytes, bytes, right? So you can just say, I want something that's 17 8 bytes over there. So you move 8, 8, and you do that 17 times. 17 is in one of your registers, and so it becomes really easy. Right? It's also, the other reason is that if you were to make this arbitrary, first of all, you make it slower. Second of all, you actually occupy more, you take up more silicon in your CPU to be able to accommodate all that stuff. Every single instruction you see here takes up physical space. The more of those you have, the more heat you generate, the more expensive your CPU has become, the more harder it is to debug, the more kind of, there's all sorts of things that work against it. You want to keep it as minimal as possible, right? So anyway, that's what we were able to do. So this, there's actually, this is the general formulation, and here are the special cases we have, where we just say, hey, I want to be able to move, um, I want to move, shouldn't be allowed to type. Okay, here we go. Uh, move out what's in ECX, EDX to ESI. What would this mean? Hmm? What is the memory address on the computer? CX. CX plus EDX. And so in other words, the implied scaling factor is one, if it's not specified. Mm -hmm. And the implied offset, if it's not specified, is <coughs> Make sense? But there's no register here, it's just implies also zero, right? So I could do this, and I could even say, oh, I want like eight times this one here. So I could add an eight, and I can even skip this and put a five in here, an offset, a minus five. So I can do whatever I want, right? Let's do a, yeah, so one of my students actually, uh, so I'm gonna try to <laughs> show one of my courses because this is hard. Uh, this is for two dimensional arrays, which is kind of what you can reference using this set of Unfortunately, there's an error in it. <laughs> but I never told that person. I'm safe to say that. Oh, I'm recording this. Okay. Um, <laughs> good. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, this is the data representation. So notice something interesting here. If I um, if I'm working on 32-bit registers and I say that I want an int, I get a four byte type. If I say I want a log int, I can get a four byte type. Right? If I get a character and one bytes to play around with, it's actually implemented as a four byte type. Because, you know, um, a float is four bytes, double is eight, long double, still eight. And a care pointer is four bytes in 32 bits and then eight bytes in 64 bits. Why all the time? Memory. So yeah. the whole when we talk about 32 bits and 64 bits, that's the width of the memory that we're talking about. We're talking about the number of bits that you have to represent an address. So two to the 32 is four gigabytes. And that's also 32 bits is also four bytes. Right? It's just eight bits per byte. And so if you want to be able to reference all of your 64 bits, you need eight bytes to do so. Right? Anyway, so that's super any factor. So now we talk to with registers, and we feel like we really understand them. We're ready to take and examine them, right? Yes. Right? Yes? No? Yes? Good. I have no idea how to interpret what you guys are saying. Oh, I see thumbs up. This is a very good signal. It's a very clear signal. I don't know that I will ever see thumbs down, but please let me know if I'm going too fast or too slow. Okay? Anyway, so that was registers. Now we can move to the next thing, which is computational addresses. So I showed you how you can, in a single move line, um, do kind of an indirect reference to a different part of memory. Now we actually have something called Leo here, which is a, uh, cover them here. Uh, we're not doing Leo. No. Where we can take, where we can just actually end up with the pointer that we want. So when I say move, really what's happening 
is that we're moving something from a source to destination, and the source could be expressed as this convoluted thing like this guy over here. So that would be the source. But I can actually now do something slightly different and step back a little bit and say, well, I actually I'm not so interested in just moving stuff. I just want to know where did I end up? So I can say, please let EDX be a pointer that is the result of this computation over there. In other words, just take EIX, and work on CCX, add 16 to it, and tell me what the value is. Okay. It's called load effective address. This is just pointer arithmetic. Why am I showing you this? Well, it's because that's not how it's used. So some people figured that, like, well, actually, for instance, if I want to multiply by 12, then the built-in assembler method for integer multiplication is kind of slow. So what I'm going to do instead, and this is what most of your compilers will do, is that I'm just going to do this. I'm going to take the value. I'm going to load the address of EAX, except here it's not even an address. It's just a value. And I'm going to add double it to itself. What have I done? <coughs> That's right. I have tripled it, right, in this convoluted way. And now what I do? I shift it arithmetic left by two bits, which is equivalent to multiplying it by four, two to the two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and we'll see some math. So this is actually what you're going to see if you're multiplying the 12. This also means that you're going to be looking at some of your assembly code and like, what? <laughs> Why? Is it, right? And it's because this is actually significantly faster than calling the integer multiplication for 12. <sighs> yeah. So bear with me. There's a lot of legacy to go through. Okay. So we do these things here. Let me take a step back here and just uh, have you guys do this computation here. Expression OX8 of EDX is what address? Can hear anyone? Seven thousand and eight, right? Uh, okay, we'll, I don't have answers here, but we'll just do it. Seven thousand and eight, right? Yeah. What is the next one? There's destructive interference. Seventy-two, right? Seven two zero zero, right? And uh, we have ETS or does ECS? Oh, good, yes. Uh -oh. oh no! Oh. We're in hex, right? What's two ten seven? Is that saying two times seven thousand? <laughs> yes. It's saying two times seven thousand and then add eighty to it, right? But 14, that means that we're working in hexadecimal, right? So 7 times 2 is? D? D? Or E? <laughs> <laughs> Alright guys, 7 plus 7. <laughs> <laughs> We're figuring out that in hex, like, it's 14, which is equivalent to what in hex? E sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. How could we figure that out really quick? We don't remember. 15 is F. You can think about it. OX10 is 16, because it's 16 bit, right? So we can subtract 2. That'd be one to do it. So it's like, oh, it's not 10, it's FE. You can do that, right? It's just something to think about. So the, the overall address here is not going to be OX. Zero, eight, zero. Good. Great. This makes sense, right? <laughs> this is why you'll bring calculators to the final, won't you? <laughs> oh, yeah. It just means that the, it's implied that there's nothing here, right? There's just no register. It just means don't add anything as a base, but add two times whatever is here. Right? So it's just one of the special cases. Make sense? Good. Okay. So, more arithmetic operations. So we can't just 
why would we really sad if we could just add stuff? Right? Fortunately, we can do a little bit more than just add stuff. We can also make good stuff. It's special that we need. But we can uh, subtract things. We can multiply them. We can do a shift here. We can, oh, we have three different types of shift here. What? Why are there three? Hmm. This is suspicious, isn't it? It should really be two, right? So you only like you shift to the left, shift to the right. Right? Okay. One of them you the first byte. Yes, you're right on the money. Yes. In one of them, you are doing what's called arithmetic shift. Which means that like, oh, if there's like a leading bit. We want to carry that through. Why do we want to do that? What? Negative numbers. This is for what's called two's complements. Have you guys heard about two's complements? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you remember that, right? So when I have a negative number and I want to like shift it by two, which is effectively dividing it by four, I want to make sure that I get a number that's somehow close to that, and therefore I maintain it. But then I can also have an unsigned number, right? Which means that if I shift it, I don't care about the top order bit. So both of these are implemented like this. So in other words, assembly has absolutely no differentiation between signed and unsigned types. The only way you find out is by looking how the data has been used. So if you see a shift arithmetic graph, you're like, oh yeah, it must be a signed number. Make sense? Because so this doesn't even matter. We have the and and or and XOR and all this stuff. So remember that the source and destination are like this. So the latter one is what takes the data <coughs> that's been used. So destination shifted by a source. So this is five comma destination. This is the right? Cool. And then we have increase by one, decrease by one, negate, and not. What's the difference between negating and doing a not? I take a number and I negate it, and I take that same number and I do a knock on it. How different are the results? Hmm? Well, the thing that assembly is just going to crudely be like, oh, just imagine your sign and just like change everything. I did. It doesn't care. It just takes everything and flips it, right? And not. It's not like it's just like, oh, this thing. <coughs> Uh, I'm going to throw an exception. You're the CPU, you're just going to, I'm going to crash. Right? If you do something like that. Right? It's going to melt. The difference is one. Right? Because if I wanted to, for instance, if I wanted to negate something, in two, two complements, remember you can negate it by swapping all the bits, but then you're one off. Why are we one off? In two complements. Why shouldn't negation and, and uh, doing a not? Why shouldn't it be the same as that? <coughs> yes, you want one zero, right? Do you guys remember this discussion from an assembly class? If you don't do that, then you have oh, I forgot to check if it was negative zero. Can you imagine coding where you're like, oh, I have to check both zeros? What? Right? That would make no sense. But this also means that you end up with really weird idiosyncrasies. Like, you have more negative numbers than positive numbers. So if I take, for instance, the number OX10000, well, however many bits, right? Which is pretty much like the smallest negative number, or biggest negative number, depending on your sign, that I could represent. So like, let's say it's minus 2 billion, right? 2 billion. And I want to do a knock on this. So let's say that this is my number uh, y is equal to this, and I want to do a minus y. If I print minus y, what do I get? I take minus 2 billion and I do negative that number. You can just see it in action, actually. Uh, let's check our poor little hello program and do one more thing with it. Hello again, and let's do print d. And we're going to do uh, y, what we're just going to do here. Uh, Int y equals ox1. This one right here. Okay. This is just printing out the actual value here. Make hello. 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 Oh, that didn't work. One, two, three. 
Oh, uh, uh, hold on. It's A two zero that I want. Sorry, I'm, I'm confused here. Make hello. The smallest negative number is eight because I just want the higher order bit. Right? Okay, so this is the number minus two billion, two point one billion, right? I want to know negate it. Y equals minus y. <laughs> what do you think will be printed? Hmm? Zero. Positive to billion. Would be what you might expect, right? Zero is kind of the answer to every math problem, right? If somebody asks, like, what's this whole thing resolves to zero? <laughs> What's the number minus one, which would be like two billion, so minus one, right? Let me show you something really, really weird. Yes, I did, didn't I? I can't represent this number with the positive numbers. I have more negative numbers than I have positive numbers because of zero. And this is the smallest negative number, and I can't, I have no physical way of representing it as positive. So what happens is that it's just like, oh, okay. I have, like, if you look at it in just bits, just binary, right? Here's what's happening. This is the binary number. And we're going to do, uh, when we negate something, we flip every bit, and then we add one. <laughs> Not very fruitful, huh? This actually is a bug in MySQL. By the way, if you, if you use this number, you'll freeze MySQL. If you want to really be faster. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you.